Ask somebody next to you. Smile real big. First of all, I need y'all to smile at me. Some of y'all ain't smiled since I've been in here. Amen. I want to see you smile, and I want to see you smile at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor next to you and ask them this all-important question. How good is God? Come on, ask them. Ask, ask your neighbor, say, how good, how good is God? How good is God? Is God a good God? Has God been good to you? Has God blessed you? I know I'm looking for somebody that God's blessed. I'm, not, I'm looking for somebody that says God's been mighty good to me. Come on, praise him if he's been real good to you. Hallelujah. If you praise him for the breath in your body, you praise him for the food on your table, you praise him for the shoes on your feet, the clothes on your back, you praise him for your children, you praise him for your family. God is a good God. How good is God? And if you'll bear with me and just give me a few minutes, I'll preach this sermon and expedite this sermon and you can go and do what you need to do because I know this is a big week for everybody. But I want to talk to you on this subject today. How good is God? First of all, before we can go in, in any further and answer this question, I want to share this with you. It's important for every one of us in this room to understand and to know that every word in the Bible, every word in the Bible is completely inerrant. Let me say that again, inerrant. The Word of God is inerrant. That means there are no errors in God's Word. The Word of God was penned by the, by the men of old under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's the inerrant Word of God. Every word from Genesis chapter 1 to, Genesis, or to Revelation 22, every word from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is true. As a matter of fact, you have to be careful with the Word of God because in the latter part of Revelation 22, in the last few verses, it tells us to be careful to, about adding to God's Word. It tells us to be careful about taking away from God's Word. And so it, before we can ever establish the goodness of God and understand by His Word how good He is, we have to realize His Word is inerrant. His word is true. As a matter of fact, this is what Paul, how Paul said it to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says this, all scripture, somebody say all scripture. He said, all scripture is God breathed. It's given by divine inspiration and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is given divinely by God Almighty. And when we take this in consideration and we think about it today, then it opens up the door as we look at God's Word to answer this question. How good is God? And maybe there's one verse in the 150 divisions of Psalms, in Psalms 33 verse 5, maybe there's one verse that can, that can uh, we can put it all in a that wrap it all up in a nutshell. It says he loves righteousness and justice. And this is what I want you to notice. The earth is full. Somebody say the earth's full. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And everybody look at me. When you get home, I want you to, this is your homework today. When you get home, I want you to set your family down and I want you all to read the entire chapter of Psalms 104. Because what the psalmist does in context in, in, in Psalms 104, the psalmist begins to explain how God Almighty placed everything in the earth and how everything works together to take care of one thing and another. 
He lays it all out, how God perfectly created everything around us. Now, this is what the Bible says. The Bible said everything we know came by God and through God. And God in his, in, in his, uh, uh, in, in his omnipotence and God being divine and God being with, without any kind of flaw, he's a flawless God, made everything he made to work perfectly together to, to, so that the world functions and, and operates as it should. We're everything you have and everything I have and everything we need, God put it in the earth for us. There's nothing in this earth that God doesn't have his hand on. Amen. Seven amens. That's great. There's nothing in the earth that God doesn't have his hand on. Everything you see around you, you can walk outside this, this room today. You can see the trees that are around us. Those trees have a purpose. They're producing things that need to be produced so that we can live like we live. See, what's wrong with us today is we have this long list of things that we haven't got, that we want, that makes us ungrateful when we should sit down and make a list of everything we do have <laughs> that we take for granted that will make us grateful. You see, we look at the Thanksgiving season as a day. Thanksgiving to us is one day. It's one day, everybody gets together, everybody cooks food, everybody's got fried chicken, turkey, ham, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes. Come on, somebody help me out. Amen. We got all this good stuff that we all eat, and we look at this day with family gets together, we enjoy each other, we laugh, we say a cute little three-minute prayer before the meal, and we've done God a favor. But Thanksgiving is not a day. Thanksgiving is a lifestyle. You have to have a certain mindset in order to live a life that is grateful. I want to challenge somebody in this Thanksgiving season to take out a piece of paper and start beginning to write down the things that God has blessed you with. Start writing them down. And when you start to think about it, you'll have to turn the paper over. Come on, somebody. And you'll have to continue to write because I can tell you there are things that we take for granted that God has placed in the earth to make sure that we have that we have the air that we need to breathe, the water that we need to drink, the food that we need to eat, the proper sunshine we need. God has put it all in place so that we can have the life that we live. How good is God? The earth is full, the Bible said, of his goodness. This is what I want you to understand. When we talk about the goodness of God, there's a few things I want you to write down. First of all, when we think about the goodness of God and how good God is, I want you to know that the Lord will provide. He is our provider. He's our provider. In the Old Testament account of the life of Abraham, in Genesis 22, Abraham is, God has given Abraham his promised child, one that he and his wife Sarah had believed for over 25 years for God to give them the promised child. They believed God. They didn't stagger in their faith. They waited all this time for God to give them this promise. And then when God gives them this promised child, the Lord comes to, the Lord God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to take Isaac, your promised son, and I want you to sacrifice him on the altar to me. As we go in there, and, he, and this, is, this is taking place in Genesis 22, as Abraham goes to, to offer Isaac to the Lord, God gives Abraham and he provides Abraham a blessing. He, he provides him in, in Genesis twenty two thirteen. 13. The Bible said, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son Isaac. And Abraham called the name, now I want you to watch this. Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. <laughs> Put your hand on your neighbor and say, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. 
the Lord will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord God that supplies all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's our provider. Anything we have need of, the Lord provides. Look at an interesting verse of scripture in that chapter. Don't forget to do your homework, Psalms 104. But look at one verse in Psalms 104, verse 14 in the Amplified. The Bible said, he causes grass to grow for the cattle. Who causes grass to grow for the cattle? He grows it for the cattle so the cattle can get what? Fat. Hello, somebody. He's got to feed the cattle so the cattle can feed you. Amen. Preach on, Pastor. And all that the earth produces for cultivation by man so that he may bring food from the earth. Pastor, what are you trying to say? Let me simplify it for you. When you rode by the, that, that cow pasture on the way to church this morning, you should have lifted both hands and say, the Lord will provide. Amen. As you watch that cow eat grass, <laughs> come on somebody, you should have said the Lord Right there, the Lord is providing. That cow is making itself fat for me. Hello? Where do you think that hamburger came from? Amen. This is, the, this is scripture. It's, it's God in the earth. He put it, the grass is growing for a reason. It's not grass doesn't just grow so you can have a beautiful front yard. God put grass in the earth to feed the things that need to be fed. They need to be fed. He's taking care of them. And in return, they're going to be taking care of us. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to remind us in this Thanksgiving season that God has perfectly designed the earth like it is to take care of everything that lives in it. That's who God is. He said, so that he may bring food from the earth. Next time you ride by the chicken house, say, thank God for chicken. Amen. Wave your hand if you love chicken. Come on. Wave your hand if you love chicken. Look around and see anybody that's not waving their hand. Don't just move to the other side. Don't trust them. Amen. I told the first service, the last church I pastored, I was standing at the back door shaking hands one day with everybody. And back then I was a little bit fuller than I am now. Now, I'm a little fuller than I was back in the summer, but don't you worry about that. I'm going to take care of that someday. But anyway, I was bigger than then. I weighed a lot more than I do now. And this person walked by me as they were shaking hands and tapped me on my stomach and said, Pastor, that is a chicken graveyard right there, ain't it? <laughs> and I thought for a minute, and I said, you know, that's true. It is. It's a chicken graveyard. And the next time you ride by the chicken house, lift your hands and say, look, <laughs> the Lord will provide. When you ride by, when you ride by a field and you see things growing in the field, and you see that stuff coming up, does, do you ever think about this? I don't know about maybe I'm just shallow. shallow. Maybe you are just so much smarter than I am, and I'm just a simple guy. But do you ever think about how all that works? Do you ever think about how you can put just a seed, a little seed, in the ground and it sprouts up and does what it does? You think about that. I think about it all the time. You think about how an apple tree comes from an apple seed. Is that not marvelous? Is that not miraculous? I'm simple learner. To think that all those apples come from one little seed. God had a plan. And that it goes and all this stuff works together. And, and, and isn't it amazing that how, how that there's areas on the earth that the snow melts and, water, and runs down the mountains and into a valley so that it will provide what needs to be provided. God 
knew all of that. The master designer knew all of this, y'all, before the earth was ever formed. He began to speak these things into existence and he perfectly put in place everything that's been here. And what we need to do during this season is we need to wake up tomorrow morning and we need to look around us and see the goodness of God in the land of the living and quit belly aching about the car that you're not driving and thank God for the one that you do have. Quit belly aching about the house you don't live and thank God for what you do have. Come on, thank God that tomorrow morning there's going to be food on your table, shoes on your feet, clothes on your back, a roof over your head. How good is God? How good is God? How good is God? He's our provider. He causes grass to grow for the cattle and all the earth produces for cultivation by man. It's all out there. It's all out there. Somebody grows all that stuff we eat, y'all. It comes from the earth and God. God made all that work like it does. Thank God he did, amen? Hallelujah. Not only is he... Do we, when we're talking about how good God is, do we need to talk about that, the fact that he's our provider? But I also want you to understand he's our protector. He is our protector. There's no need in living in fear. As a matter of fact, that's what the psalmist was saying in Psalms 23, 1, when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. He he, he watches over me. He protects me. He takes care of me to feed, to guide, and to shield me. So I shall not want. I don't have to walk in fear. I don't have to worry because the Lord is looking over me. Psalms 91.4 says, He will cover you and completely protect you with his pinions. And under his wings you will find what? Refuge. His faithfulness. God is faithful, and his faithfulness is a shield and a wall for us. He's our protector today, y'all. There's no need in our children. Why? Why do we have a young generation plagued by anxiety when we hold in our hand the word of the living God that we could use against the spirit of fear? that has come over this this society. We need to be declaring the word of the Lord over ourselves and let and remind our children that the angels encamp themselves around about them that fear the Lord, that our babies can go to bed at night and rest and sleep well because God is looking after us. God takes care of who? Listen, let me tell you something. I got a gun. Huh? Huh? I got a gun. Somebody said, Pastor, why you want to say that? Well, I just want you to know I got a gun. I got a gun. I own more than one. I can use one. I can shoot one. Huh? And I believe that God intends for me to be the protector of my house. I believe that. I ain't going to let nobody come in and do nothing to my family. I got one. Sits right next to me at night. It ain't this, it ain't me. You know, it's just one right. Well, Pastor, you believe in God? Yeah, I believe God wants me to protect my house. I don't think it's a sin for me to protect my house. You come in my house unwanted, start toward one of my family, and let me tell you something, I ain't the only one that can use one. Matter of fact, the youngest one in the house can use one better than anybody in the house. (laughs) You you probably don't want to go in his room. But I'm just saying, but here's what I want you to understand. (laughs) I'll never forget as long as I live. I got to tell you this. My grandma, Calfee, that was my mama's mother. My grandma Kathy was a granny. Anybody have a great? Some people have. Some people have nanas and nana. If if you call yours nana, that's fine. I'm not I'm making fun of you. I had a granny. You know what a granny is? A granny was one. My granny was about this tall. She was about that tall, about this big around, and she wore uh, polyester dresses that she made. Come on, y'all. 
And I lived in the house with her when I was going to Bible college. I lived in the house with my grandmother. I loved my granny. She loved me. My granny spoiled me, man, and go take me to the grocery store. And she would tell me, Bo Jean, you get whatever you want, baby. You can have, put it in granny's basket. And I, boy, I mean, that's why I wouldn't stay with granny, y'all. Mom and daddy didn't do that. But granny did. But my little old granny, one time somebody tried to break in the house. I wasn't there at the time. And they were, they were living, just her and my grandfather, and he was blind. And somebody ripped the latch off of the screen door trying to get in their house one night. But something scared them off. So the next day, my, my uncle that come to check on them every day came to the house and said, and, and Granny went in and got a change purse about that big. She kept all her money in a change purse. And she popped that little change purse open, pulled out a couple hundred dollars and gave it to my uncle. And she said, go to down to the store, down to the hardware store, and buy me a shotgun. And my uncle said, Mama, what you mean a shot? What you need a shotgun? She said, somebody trying to break in the house last night. And she said, well, Mama, you ain't going to kill nobody, are you? She said, no, I'm just, if they try again, I'm just going to blow the legs out from under them. <laughs> that was my granny. That's how she did. So, but but I'm, I'm saying this. The greatest protection I have, though, I want to put, I want to serve notice on the devil today that my greatest protection is not a 12 gauge or a 20 gauge or, or, or a, a, a 270 or a little whatever those little pistols they got at the house. I don't, oh, that's not my greatest protection. My greatest protection is that I have angels that when I get ready to go to bed at night, they encamp themselves around about my bed that my hand, the hand, I'm under the ref, I'm under the shadow of the Almighty. I don't have to fear anything in this world world or out of this world. I don't have to fear principalities or powers or spiritual wickedness in high places. There's too many people that are fearing demonic presence. I don't fear demonic presence because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I wish somebody full of the Holy Ghost would give God a praise that said I'm not afraid of the devil today. Bring it on. house don't belong to the enemy. God is our protector. Psalms 91 said he's our refuge, our shield. He's our protector. Not only is he pro our provider, not only is our, he our protector, he is our healer. Psalms 103 verses 2 and 3 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not. Somebody say forget not. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all of our iniquities and who heals all of our diseases. Let me go ahead and tell you something. God, it's not that God was a healer. It's that God is a healer. Amen. Hear me. Malachi says, through the prophet Malachi, the Lord God said, I am God and I change not. Jehovah Jireh, the nature of God that heals, has not changed to this day. I, he is a healer. He said, I am God and I heal and I change not. The New Testament Go from Malachi to Hebrew, and, and Hebrews, and, the, and Hebrews says, he said, I'm the same, and I'm the same, and I'll be the same. He was a healer. He's a healer, and he'll be a healer tomorrow. He's still a healer. It hasn't changed. What happens is, is you've got some of the modern day teachings in some churches that say, well, all the, the miracles and the signs and the wonders and all the things that we read about in the, old, in, in, in the book of Acts and, all, and back there, all of those supernatural things were for that dispensation of time, but not for this dispensation of time because all of that went, you know, uh, it, it went away with the, with, with the last prophets and, 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 and all these things have ceased. Well, the scripture says actually that those things will cease when that which is perfect has come. So he hadn't come yet, so it hadn't ceased. And when you think about it, it's kind of crazy anyway, the idea of that. If you got a picture of what they said, they said those things died out with the death of the last apostle. So really the miraculous really depended on the life of John. 
because he was the last of the apostles to live. So what did it look like at that time? Were people standing in line? Was, I mean, maybe were people checking John's temperature? Boy, don't let him get a fever because when he's dead, it's all gone. Oh, we're going to wait on. And, and here is here, is here the, uh, the apostle John the breathing the last breath of his life. Y'all get in line. Get, him, get your miracle. Get your miracle. He's breathing his last breath. Get your miracle. Get your miracle. It's crazy. No, healing is for today. Healing is for right now. First Peter, it, Isaiah said it in Isaiah 53, 5. It's repeated by, by Peter in 1 Peter 2, 24. Why is it repeated by Peter in 1 2, 24? Because, 1 Peter 2, 24, because it is for now. And Peter says, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Let me tell you something. You cannot belittle the work of Calvary. Not only was the cross of Calvary for your sins and your iniquities, not only does the blood of Jesus wash away the sins of men, it was the stripes of Calvary that he bore our healing, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of us, our peace is upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I like to see it like this. I like to get a picture of it like this. Jesus laid over an old whipping post uh, and the Roman soldier with a cat of nine tail, when he would lay that across the back of Jesus, I could hear Jesus say, that was for cancer. Uh, that one was for sugar diabetes. Uh, that one was for high blood pressure. That one was for leukemia. I'm here to tell you today that Jesus bore the stripes of Calvary that you can be healed. How many of you believe today that Jesus is a healer? Let the redeemed of the Lord praise him if you believe it. He's a healer. But see, this is what I want you to understand. If you understand God in all of his glory, in all of his strength, in all of his knowledge, in all of his wisdom, that he's God, God chooses to heal like he wants to heal. See, what we need to quit doing is playing God. Well, I, don't, I think it needs to be done. No, you need to leave healing. You ain't a healer. And you need to leave healing up to the healer. That's why we, that's what I'm saying. That's why right now in our, in our nation, we need to leave the giver of life up to the giver of life. And quit trying to control it ourselves. You don't need, you don't need me to break that down for you? Uh, it ain't our, you don't have the right to take life. From the womb to the tomb, you don't have the right. Help, God help preachers that are afraid to say things right now, that aligns itself with the word of God. I, li, listen, what I just said to you is not politics. Don't drag me into your political fight. What I just said to you is the word of God. Hallelujah. From, from that from your mother's womb, God had his hand on you. Amen. All the way through. God help us all. And, and, and let me tell you something. Look at me. I've been preaching a long time. I quit being scared a while back. I don't have to have help to preach the truth. It doesn't change. Amens don't change or, or lack of amens don't change the truth. Well, I'll preach over here. Amen. It's still God's word. We have to stand on the truth of God's word. God is a healer. But let me tell you something. God in all of his wisdom and all of his knowledge and all of his glory can heal like he wants to. Some, do you know God? God will use medicine to heal people. He'll use a doctor to heal somebody. Where do you think the doctor got his knowledge from? Got it from God. God taught him everything he knew. That's why we don't give God the glory that belongs to him. Doc, God uses medicine. God uses doctors. Listen to your doctor. Follow their instruction. They went to school, educated themselves. God give them the ability to learn what they learn and know what they know. 
Now, anything that they might say to you contrary to the word of God, just don't, don't argue with them. You know what God's word said. Just go on about your business. But let me tell you something too. If God heals your body, if you got high blood pressure and God heals your high blood pressure, he'll use your doctor to confirm that he healed your high blood pressure. Come on, somebody. What? And let him take you off of it. Then you know God did it. Well, I'm going to have to preach over here. It seems like I ought to. to. Amen. Let God do it. God will use medicine. I found out just recently, over the last several months, I found out that God will use doctors to heal you. I had been a doctor in 30 plus years, and I developed a hernia. I was coming up here Sunday after Sunday preaching and hurting. I mean in pain. I get so, some Sundays I'd be in such pain, I'd tell Danny, I said, Danny, we got to get out the back door. I can't shake hands with nobody. I'm hurting so bad today. And I just kept believing God to heal me and believing God to heal me. And God gave me peace to go see a doctor. And God gave me peace to go see the right doctor. And God hooked, it, hooked me up with the right doctor, a doctor that believes in God. Amen. Come on, somebody. And, and practices faith. But he's also a good surgeon. If you're going to go to one, go to a good one. Amen. And he set me down and walked me through it and told me what he was going to do and did what he said he was going to do. And I'm back where he said I would be. And guess what, y'all? Look here today. I am healed in Jesus' name. I'm past that, I'm, I'm past that hernia. I'm, in the, I'm back in the gym. I'm lifting weights. He said I could go back to lifting weights and doing things. I'm doing that again. I feel better than I've ever felt. And that hernia is gone. And God used a doctor to do it. I don't give the glory to Dr. Martin. I give the glory to Dr. Jesus. He did it. He gave him the wisdom to do it. God is our healer. How good is God? He's our healer. How good is God? He's our provider. How good is God? He's our protector. How good is God? He is our peace. And as they're getting ready to play and sing this morning. God is our peace today. What I'm finding out and what I've heard more people say recently than I've ever heard in my lifetime is I've heard people literally make this statement, Pastor, I would give up everything I own if I could just have peace. If I could just have peace in my life. People are searching for peace. You know who he is? He is Jehovah Shalom. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Where does peace come from? Where does real peace come from? Let me show you. Hang with me. Don't, don't, don't miss out. Hang with me. Watch this. Jesus made a, a, a state <coughs> to his apostles and to his followers before he got ready to get up out of here. He made this statement to them in John 14, 27. As he got ready to leave, he said, Peace. I leave with you. Now I want you to read it with me. He said, peace, I leave with you. Peace, I give to you. Is that what it said? No. It said, my peace. That's an important word. Can't leave that out. He didn't say, peace, I leave with you, peace, I give you. No, he said, my peace. And then he states this. He said, not as the world gives do I give to you. You see, let me go ahead and tell you, there's things that will bring you temporary peace. Think about it. And then I got high. Huh? Temporary peace. Am I really right about it? How many of you got, how many had any temporary peace? Come on, be real about it. Some of y'all been saved so long you forgot about temporary peace. You had temporary peace. But how many of you realized after a while it was temporary? 
It only lasted for a little bit. Bacardi is only temporary peace, y'all. And after a while, you're going to have to drink more of it to try to get the peace. And then after a while, it becomes a bigger problem than it's done you good. Because you know what that is? It's the peace that the world gives you. But Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And he said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm going to give you my peace. And then he describes it. As a matter of fact, the scripture describes it. Let me say it like this. The apostle Paul describes my peace, what Jesus talks about. In 4.6 of Philippians, he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and watch this, what the peace of what? The peace of who? The peace of God. What did Jesus say to him? He said, my peace. So the direct reference that Paul is talking to the church at Philippi about is not just peace. He's talking to them about the peace of God. Now, now get that. Get that in and understand that. The peace of God. And then he, he describes what that peace is like. He said, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace of God. It passes all understanding. It's beyond human comprehension. It guards our hearts. It guards our minds. You see, the peace of God, y'all, is, is what God supernaturally gives us when we walk through troubles of life. When you go through what some of you are walking through right now, the peace of God is what he gives you when there is trouble on every side. The peace of God comes in when, in, when you're going through a breakup in a relationship. When you're dealing with struggles with your children and with your finances. When all hell is broke loose. That's when God gives us peace to walk through storms in our life. Not, not temporary peace, not something you stored up your nose. No, something you can have that will get you through every season of your life. The peace of God. That, that doesn't make any sense. How do you have peace? How are you still praising God? How can you still lift your hands? How can you still honor the name of the Lord? How do you continue to do what you do? I don't know how I do it, but all I know is I got something on the inside of me that just keeps me together. It just continues to keep me alive. It helps me to, fo to focus. It helps me to, 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 to be able to survive, to operate, to do what I do. I don't know. If I can be set right in the midst of, a, of turmoil, but yes, I can just have this peace that comes over me. How good is God that he would put in place what you need to get you through anything. You hear me? Anything. What is it you're going through right now? That peace will get you through it. How does a man lose his whole family? How is he the proud father of 10 beautiful children one day and they're all dead the next? How is he the proud owner of all of this property and land and the richest man in the east. Wake up one morning broke. All 
his kid's dad broke. And then he sees that something's breaking out all over his body and he's scratching himself and his nerves are just physically, he's a mess. Financially, he's a mess. His family's gone. What causes a man when his wife says, hey, you, best thing for you to do is curse your God. And he says, no, 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 woman, don't forget this. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. How can a man worship? How can a man praise? How can a man lift up the name of God when he has gone through that kind of hell? How can he do it? No other way to explain it. You know what it's called? The peace of God that passes all understanding. God gives it to you to do whatever God calls you to do and whatever assignment that God gives you in life, he gives you the peace to walk through it. Sometimes things can get crazy. This very week, this very weekend, I'm on the phone with people, counseling with people that are going through trouble in their homes. Hours, my wife and I, hours on the phone. Only to hang the phone up to get a phone call from the man who pastors the church that I used to pastor, that the elder that I put into place, a man that we love dearly, that was such a big part of our church, had a, a stomach aneurysm and instantly died. Only to hang up that phone and a half hour later to get the word that one of our members of our church has been in an automobile accident. She was instantly killed and her two grandbabies are in the hospital in serious condition. And I have to throw my clothes on and ride to the hospital and walk into that hospital to walk in to look at a dad that's lost his mama and two children. What am I going to say to them in the natural? How am I going to help them? There's nothing I can say, nothing I can do. I'm not that smart. I'm not that wise. But there's something I have on the inside of me that gave me peace. As I was walking up to that hospital, it gave me peace to be what God's called me to be, to be a pastor that has to be there in troubled times for people. And I was able to take them by the hand. Pray with them. <laughs> and I put my hand over that one child and I spoke the name of Jesus. Just me and him. And I thought he was unconscious. They told me he was unconscious. And I spoke the name of Jesus and I prayed over him. And I got down close to him so I, he could hear, his subconscious could hear me. And I said, Son, hang in there. God's got you. Don't give up. And immediately he said, always. <laughs> always. <laughs> Let me tell you all something. God had all this He's got it all in his divine plan. It's a time, Solomon said, a time to be born, a time to die. Time to plan, a time to pluck up that which has been planted. All of this is in God's plan. You're, listen, it's all, there, yeah, death is real and, and all these things are real and trauma is real. and all. But don't you think God has put something in place that helps us through it all? It's called the peace of God. peace of God then it's here for you right now whoever you are wherever you are and whatever you're walking through let his peace reign in your life stand with me all over the room all my life you have been faithful 